Hello and welcome to our NYU Langone Orthopedic Webinar Series, Robotic Assisted Spine Surgery, Pearls and Pitfalls. Thank you for joining us. My name is Tyler and I will be the facilitator for the presentation today. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to acquaint you with a few features of this web event technology. On the right-hand side of your screen, you will see the Q&A window. To send a question, click in the text box and type your text. When finished, click the Send button or press Enter. All questions that you submit are only seen by today's presenters. Your questions will be responded to in the order in which they were received and will be addressed throughout and at the end of the presentation. We are joined today by our presenters, Sharla R. Fisher, MD, Jeffrey Andrew Goldstein, MD, Young H. Kim, MD, Demi Protosaltis, MD, and at this time, I would like to turn the microphone over to Dr. Fisher to get started. Thank you, Tyler. So uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for attending this webinar on um, robotic-assisted spine surgery, pearls and pitfalls. Uh, we have a very um, uh, interesting and educational session for you tonight. So first, we're going to go over the learning curve associated with uh, robotic-assisted spine surgery with Dr. Goldstein. Um, Dr. Probe Saltis will discuss advantages of robotic assisted uh, deformity surgery. I'll review some uh, um, tips and tricks around single position lateral spine surgery. And then wrapping us up will be Dr. Kim reviewing radiation safety and robotics. Um, Dr. Probe Saltis is currently in the OR, so we may move his presentation uh, to last. And uh, we will be collecting your questions throughout. And then um, at, uh, towards the end, we'll go over those questions in the discussion section. And then we'll be done by 9.30. So now I'd like to kick it over to Dr. Goldstein to go over the learning curve associated with robotic-assisted spine surgery. Great. Thank you, Dr. Fisher. And welcome, everybody, to our spine webinar. I'm going to be talking about our experience here at NYU with a transition to robotics and talk about the uh, learning curve and uh, present some of the research that we've done with uh, one of our previous fellows. Uh, my most pertinent disclosure is that I am a consultant for Globus. So I think my transition probably is best to talk about first my practice and what I'm transitioning from. So I have a degenerative spine surgery practice, and the deformity I have in my practice includes instability, things like spondylolisthesis, and as I tell my partners, the deformity that I, uh, that I create. Um, NYU is an urban academic medical center that, um, that draws patients uh, from the tri-state area and around the country. And my practice is predominantly decompressions, microdiscectomies. My fusion practice is predominantly anterior and posterior procedures, T-lifts, lateral lumbar inner body fusions, posterior spinal fusions. And we were one of the uh, first sites in the country to uh, do cervical and artificial lumbar disc replacement. We were part of the ProDisc uh, trials. And uh, I do uh, both MIS and open uh, procedures. So I think it's important to understand that as far as where I'm coming from. Um, I was trained doing open, uh, open surgery. And as my practice developed over the years, I used posterior fixation as a, as a supplement to an inner body, including anterior fusion. So we started off years ago doing translaminar facet screws as a supplement to an ALIF. And the benefit in my mind was to avoid stripping the transverse processes. And uh, there's less bleeding. I thought there was a faster recovery. And I transitioned from translaminar facet screws to percutaneous, uh, percutaneous pedicle screws. So I never really had an appreciation of where the robot would fit into my practice. Um, you know, I started using percutaneous screws. Um, this was one of the uh, first um, percutaneous uh, screws with sextant instrumentation that Medtronic sold. And these were my incisions. An A-lift procedure for L5-S1 has an incision that's probably even smaller now uh, below the umbilicus. And uh, the percutaneous screws with the sextant with the drop-down um, did not use a drop-down technique. And you can see that there were multiple, um, multiple incisions where the, uh, where the rods passed through. So why robotics? So in my mind, is for all of you who do minimally invasive procedures, you know, minimally invasive means um, maximal radiation. And the radiation exposure I was concerned about is radiation exposure to uh, the patient, the staff, and obviously myself. Uh, the more you're in spine surgery, you, you know surgeons who have over the time developed um, 
uh, sarcomas and other uh, radiation uh, sensitive uh, tumors or radi uh, tumors that are due to radiation exposure. So my interest and the goals for robotics was try to improve the accuracy and improve consistency. We were pretty good with uh, percutaneous procedures, but uh, there's still a, a number of patients that uh, from time to time have to go back to the operating room because you can't get good, um, good visualization. And that can be from the patient's uh, you know, maximal BMI or you know, it depends a lot on your, on your x-ray tech. Certainly we're always trying to improve our operative times. Um, what about the cost? You know, costs, we all know that robots, you know, come out with uh, price tags that are significant. Uh, could be uh, over a million dollars. And the thought was, is there a much less invasive approach, meaning less blood loss, less, uh, less tissue damage, uh, shorter recovery, shorter hospital stays, and, you know, can we have uh, less, chronic, less chronic pain? But what are my hesitations? You know, certainly the uh, cost is a hesitation, and will it be better than the pr procedure I'm doing now? You know, we're all the longer you're in practice, the more comfortable you get with the procedure you're doing. And um, also, is the robot as smart as it, it thinks it is? Meaning, if I go ahead and uh, ask the robot to put a screw in a certain place, will it actually put it in that place, uh, even though it's telling me that it is? And what can go wrong? You know, robots, uh, the robot we're using, we've had for almost two years now. It was approved just about two years ago by the FDA. So quite frankly, my rep's experience was only a few months longer than mine. And, uh, you know, we learn about this uh, together. So it's the fear of the unknown for anybody who tries a new procedure. Uh, you, you don't know what you may be getting into. Um, so one of our previous fellows, Deepthi Jain, who left us last year, along with uh, the spine attendants and some of the other um, fellows, looked at our initial uh, single institution uh, experience uh, using our robot for uh, pedicle screw insertion. And we evaluated 643 uh, screws, which are initial screws. So we all know that lumbar fusion is a common procedure. There's about 400,000 procedures, uh, fusions done in the U.S. in uh, 2008, and there's more since then. The number seems to be increasing every year. Uh, malpositioning of screws obviously can have uh, significant and sometimes catastrophic uh, problems with neurologic and visceral injury. Um, a screw that's not uh, biomechanically sound can lead to a higher risk of pseudoarthrosis. So, you know, robot robotics became promising with the potential to increase uh, accuracy and also to diminish our uh, radiation exposure. There were prior studies that looked at this, but it was only one uh, system that came out prior to the robot we're using now and did not have navigation. So this is the, uh, uh, the first robot that came out with, uh, with navigation and robotics. And we wanted to describe the safety with this robotic system in our first, uh, our first screws. So we had a retrospective case series we looked at consecutive patients who were undergoing thoracolumbar posterior spinal fusion with the robotic system. And uh, this was a retrospective study that looked at chart review, and we looked at our procedure notes, the success of screw placement, and uh, perioperative screw complications, and return to the operating room. And we also did a subgroup of analysis of patients who had postoperative CT scans. So we did not, uh, not every patient had a CAT scan postoperatively, but there were patients that had CT scans for one reason or another. And we graded our uh, position uh, of the pedicle screws according to the Gertzbein and Robbins uh, system. So essentially, this is a CT-guided system where grades A and B took, um, looked at screws that were less than two that were either not perforated or had not exited the pedicle, or were perforated less than two millimeters. And we considered the A's and B's uh, to be uh, to be acceptable. This is a um, this is the plan that we see intraoperatively. In the preoperative uh, in our preoperative planning, and this and this allows us to plan our screws in the uh, in the sag, uh, in the sagittal view, the axial view, also um, following the screw down the pedicle. And then we have this ghost image that you see here that um, tells us where our screws are going to be while we're planning on the preoperative uh, CAT scan. The uh, this is an intraoperative photo of the screw insertion technique using the robotic arm, and this is. Uh, and this is displayed on the, overlying, uh, on the overlying CAT scan, so you can watch in real time with your navigation where the screw is where the screw is heading. Uh, we've also done a, we included a series of uh, initial uh, single stage lateral lumbar interbody fusions, and uh, this is a uh, patient who's in the lateral decubitus position, who had um, um, a, a lateral lumbar interbody fusion followed by posterior uh, robotically placed uh, pedicle screws. Um, 
and these are the uh, navigation markers, we call them DRB, or the dynamic reference space that allows the uh, robot to see where the patient is. The, uh, so we evaluated 106 patients. Um, we, had six, we had five cases that were boarded prior to uh, screw placement, and that could be for various reasons. Either um, the, we weren't satisfied with the uh, pictures we were getting, uh, maybe the patient was too, too obese, we had problems merging to our preoperative CAT scan, but uh, we evaluated 636 pedicle screws, there were six iliac screws, and uh, one S2AI screw. There were uh, five or one percent of the patients that had screws that were not placed by the robot, and these were placed by a percutaneous technique, um, going back to our uh, previous um, technique of placing them over the guide wire through a, a jam sheeting needle. Um, as far as uh, planning method, patients can have either a preoperative CAT scan, that was 88 patients, or intraoperative uh, fluoro uh, planning. The, um, there were 86 screws that were placed through a percutaneous technique and uh, 15, um, 15 placed through an open technique, sort of meeting through direct visualization. And as I mentioned, these were uh, supplements to an inner body, either an A-lift, a lateral lumbar inner body fusion, or a T-lift. So the most important part of this slide is, uh, is the end. We had no screw-related complications and no patient that had to return to the operating room for screw revision. So um, that uh, really is a good representation of what our learning curve was. So all the screws that were not placed by the robot, as I mentioned, were placed by a floral guided technique without the robot. Uh, we had uh, four over 12 of our lateral, lateral lumbar inner body fusions were done through a single position lateral. and. Um, all of the uh, inner body fusions, meaning the A-lifts or lateral uh, inner body fusions, were done prior to uh, screw placement. So, and that's just a matter of workflow. You'll see when you do uh, robotics, it's, uh, you know, the biggest change is really uh, changing your workflow to um, um, something you're comfortable with. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we had 13 patients that, uh, or 66 screws that were evaluated with post-operative CAT scans. Out of these uh, 62 screws that were graded, uh, that we had CAT scan results on, um, 62 screws were graded as an A and four screws were graded as a, as a B. So there was 100% of the screws by the Gertzbein uh, uh, classification were acceptable, and uh, meaning that none of them penetrated outside of the pedicle more than, uh, more than two millimeters. So the navigation and robotic system, uh, although a novel technology, was used to place all these screws in, uh, in a uh, safe manner um, as a supplement to inner body techniques. And uh, although we need to prove this out long term, there is uh, certainly, uh, as you can see by our initial data, the potential to reduce uh, screw related complications. So let me uh, finish up with a, a case, uh, one of our first cases. This is a 66 year old uh, gentleman that complained of three years of low back pain radiating to his bilateral lower extremities with claudication, so stenosis. He failed non-operative treatment and had a little uh, weakness in his EHL. These are initial uh, radiographs, AP and lateral views, and you can see that there is a, a mobile spondylolisthesis at L4-5. Looking at his, uh, his images at L4-5, there is a, a moderate uh, degree of spinal stenosis with uh, significant uh, fluid within the facet joints at L4-5. L3-4 also has uh, spinal stenosis. So this patient um, underwent uh, surgery, had a uh, T-lift uh, done with uh, supplemental posterior screws. After surgery, while the patient was in the hospital, he had some um, discomfort over his right hip, which was ultimately turned out to be a trochanteric bursitis, but it was felt that it was an opportunity to get a, a CAT scan, and this just demonstrates our, um, our pedicle screw instrumentation supplementing our, um, our inner body uh, fusion and bone grafting. This is a, a patient one month postoperatively, his leg pain is resolved. You can see the, um, the laminectomy uh, defects at L3-4 and L4-5 in the screw placement. One thing you may notice with the screws, because you have the opportunity to pre-op planning, the screw position is often started uh, more laterally, and it really gives you an opportunity to uh, triangulate your screws and get uh, good biomechanical fixation. So I think with that, I'll end and uh, turn uh, the program back to Dr. Fisher, who can introduce our next speaker. And we'll take questions at the end. Thanks, Dr. Goldstein. Um, so up next, we have Dr. Pearl Saltis, who will be uh, reviewing um, the advantages of robotic-assisted uh, surgery with spine deformity. 
Thanks, Dr. Fisher. So I'm Themi Pertopsaltis. I'm uh, Chief of the Division of Spine Surgery and Orthopedic uh, uh, Surgery here at NYU Langone uh, Health. And um, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, spinal deformity and use of robotics and navigation. Um, my disclosures, uh, mostly consulting. Uh, so um, there are uh, various applications for robotics and spinal deformity. Um, just to name a few as an overview, there's screw accuracy and rotational deformities, which can be a little bit difficult to do freehand, uh, and it, obvi it obviates the need of putting on lead and bringing the fluoro in. Iliac screws uh, can be placed uh, seamlessly, particularly S2 Ehler screws, which uh, if you haven't done a ton of them, uh, you, you tend to do it with at least some uh, fluoroscopic uh, guidance uh, when placing them. Uh, it takes the guesswork out of doing those. Uh, in minimally invasive deformity, percutaneously placing the screws if you're if you're doing uh, lots of inner body cages, and then you want to percutaneously place the screws in the back. Uh, that obviously is a, is a clear application for robotics and navigation. Um, in open cases, um, uh, I like to percutaneously place the upper instrumented vertebra screws. Uh, so if I'm going to T10, I don't even expose really the, the starting point for the T10 uh, screw, which is at the top of the uh, transverse process junction uh, with the superior articulating process. So I'll, I'll leave all the muscle and facet capsule attached there and then place those screws percutaneously. I've confirmed that I like my uh, navigation with the screw below that. Um, and then um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, just general advantages um, at the end. Uh, so um, first, Let's talk about precision, and there are several studies that have looked at navigation and robotics and precision in spine uh, placing, placing the pedicle screws, uh, and you can see that uh, in this study uh, of over 2,000 patients with uh, 13,000 pedicle screws, uh, there were 0.4% navigated pedicle screws revised for malpositioning versus 1.4 in the freehand technique. So we can be excellent, uh, but we can certainly avoid situations like what's on the right uh, when we do the, the, the surgeries with navigation and robotics. Uh, in this meta-analysis of 25 studies using two different systems uh, in neurosurgery focus, uh, they looked at robotics and the accuracy of screws, and uh, they reported a range from 85 to 100% accuracy in pedicle screw placement. And the fluoro time was significantly better uh, in the robotics group. Um, they did note that when there, there were failures, it tended to be registration failures, soft tissue hindrance, and lateral skiving, which uh, is are the things that you really need to care, be careful about when you're using robotics. Um, and then let's talk a little bit about um, intraoperative confirmation of your deformity correction. And I think this is going to be the next um, the next horizon for robotics and navigation uh, because the robots and the navigated um, the systems are going to know exactly where the vertebra are positioned in space. So it's going to be just a matter of mathematics and someone coming up with a system to identify that you've placed, you know, T1 or C7 or whichever vertebra you're looking at uh, to, to determine your correction in the right place relative to the pelvis. Uh, and so I think that this is going to be the future. And there are already uh, ways of doing this um, currently. I mean, we use 36-inch cassettes as a standard in all our deformity uh, corrections. Um, but, you know, there's limitations to that. There's subject to parallax. You underexpose the pelvis and the hips and overexpose the thoracic vertebra. As you can see in the uh, image on the right, this is not a particularly obese patient, but with a lot of soft tissue over the femoral heads, you almost never see them in the obese patients. And so you have to use cues to recreate the femoral head axis, bicoxofemoral axis, and, and understand where the pelvis is. Uh, you can use the preoperative pelvic incidence to help you identify that, and we've published on it. Uh, but at the end of the day, there's a lot of mathematics and, uh, and acrobatic ma mathematics that needs to be done in order to, to identify that you've attained your global correction, uh, whereas with the newer navigated stitched fluoroscopic imaging technology, uh, like what you see on the right here, you can pretty pretty much shoot fluoros and see the femoral heads very clearly, see the S1, and you're stitching all along, so you're not over and under exposing any part of the of the spine. And you're using navigation for that, and I think that it's only a matter of time before robotics and navigation systems in general adopt and integrate that type of technology into our understanding of um, alignment. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about um, rotational deformities and how those can be a little bit difficult. You saw the study that showed uh, the accuracy of robotics. Um, here's a... Um, uh, an 
Aliac screws that replaced uh, with an S2 Ehler technique um, that could be robotically navigated. The percutaneous screws placed in this case also robotically navigated. Um, and uh, in open cases, we mentioned uh, percutaneously placing the uh, upper instrumented vertebra. And this is the type of case that I think is going to have an application. You can see that there's congenital anomalies, hemivertebra, block vertebra. Um, there's severe rotational deformity, um, there's coronal and sagittal deformity in this case, and it's, it's the type of case that you're going to want uh, to place those screws in as accurately as possible. And I think uh, robotics and navigation are going to be the answer. You can see that this patient has both coronal and sagittal deformity. She needs a major realignment and, uh, and uh, reconstruction, and you can see the final results. Excellent. So. Let's talk about uh, some cases. Here's a 74-year-old woman, back pain, leg pain. Uh, she has impaired balance, three prior lumbar surgeries, including uh, finally an L3 to S1. She has some anomalous anatomy with a uh, lumbarized S1, so um, she, she's actually fused down to S1 here, um, and a degenerative kyphoscoliosis from proximal junctional failure and degenerative disease of the adjacent level. And um, so... In this particular case, I, I plan on going up to the upper thoracic spine and uh, and then doing some posterior column osteotomies and inner body fusions to get the correction I need and to address the degenerative segments. Um, I placed uh, an alligator-type clamp. Um, I, I like to tuck the arms at the side when I do these cases up to the upper thoracic spine so that whatever 3D imaging I'm doing isn't going to be um, impaired by the positioning of the arms uh, on arm boards. Uh, and it just makes it very easy. You can use tuck them with sheets and then pull the sheets south so that they're well below uh, the bottom of the incision. And it just keeps the arms nicely out of the way and, and it helps you and whatever imaging you tend to use, uh, either intraoperative 3D or um, fluoro um, merged with a preoperative CT, whatever the workflow is um, for it to work. You can also use 2D, obviously. Um, but if the pedicles are really small and there's a lot of rotational deformity, you may choose not to. But in this particular case, we went all the way up and did the inner body, placed iliac screws, percutaneously placed the top of the, the top screws, and got the correction desired um, with good uh, uh, reliability. Um, here, as another case, uh, mostly a lumbar rotational deformity with a little bit of shift. Not a major thing, but something that I felt was very amenable to a um, uh, kind of something more minimally invasive. And a lot of the problem was, you know, foraminal stenosis from this superior articulating process that was digging into the L3 nerve root. Uh, so that was addressed. Um, did a bunch of uh, lateral interbody fusions, uh, placed an S2 Ehler iliac screw on one side, next to where uh, a transferaminal interbody fusion was placed um, and took, a, took away that superior articulating process. Um, so ultimately very happy with um, this particular case and the correction and placement of the uh, S2 Ehler. And I've been, I've been now doing those cases uh, in a single position lateral. Uh, whether or not I'm doing an A-lift or a T-lift, uh, you can still do it in a lateral position. You just, uh, if you're doing the T-lift, you, you do the T-lift on the upside. Um, and if you're placing the, um, the patient lateral for your A-lift, just make sure that your access surgeon is comfortable with that. Um, uh, but it's been it's proven to be very efficient and has cut down significantly on the amount of time because you, you save all the time in closing each incision and all the flip time and reprepping and redraping. Here's another case, uh, again, someone with a lot of rotational deformity, sagittal and coronal deformity. Um, and the plan here is for upper thoracic to lower uh, to, to S1 fusion with inner bodies and um, with uh, iliac fixation and doing multiple grade two posterior column uh, osteotomies to loosen the spine and correct the rotational deformity and the sagittal deformity. Uh, I'm almost never doing pedicle subtraction osteotomies in um, virgin uh, deformity cases. Um, you can usually loosen up the spine enough uh, to get it uh, done. And so you can see that placing all the screws, even with the rotational deformity, uh, can be pretty simple and straightforward. I think in this particular case, I used um, the preoperative CT protocol and, and merged with the uh, intraoperative fluoroscopy. And you don't have to have perfect orthogonal views of each vertebra to do that. Uh, you can um, you can wag a little bit, but uh, it doesn't have to be perfect for the robot to to understand what the anatomy is. 
And if you're doing revisions, having the screws in there is actually very very beneficial to getting your, your preoperative CT to merge with what you're doing intraoperatively. Um, so again, percutaneously placing the top screws here, and um, and I think that helps with PJK prevention. I was pretty happy with restoration of lumbar lordosis, coronal deformity correction, and sagittal correction. So I think you know you're, you're talking about deformity surgery. You always have to consider complications, uh, risk mitigation, and you know you don't want the learning curve of robotics to to, to hinder you in any way in having a, an optimal result. So we, we're aware that these are complicated surgeries with major uh, risks involved. Uh, in, in this particular study, 82 patients, you can see the, all the different complications that were listed, uh, instrumentation failure, dural tear, neural deficit, proximal junctional kyphosis and failure, um, deep wound infections, um, to name a few. And, and then, in fact, this study showed that the patients that are most likely to have complications and um, have setbacks are also the ones that are more likely to, to improve because they're the most deformed, they're the most frail, um, but you can improve their quality of life significantly because um, they have, they have, they're they not close to their ceiling. They have a far way to go. And so even uh, a, a minor improvement is a huge benefit to some of these people who are able to walk after doing surgery for them. Um, the, the differentiating factors between patients that do the best versus patients that do the worst after spinal deformity is demonstrated by this study in Smith and colleagues. And some of these things you might guess, high BMI patients, lots of comorbidities, but baseline depression, disability, very, very deformed patients, they're the ones that are most likely to have poor outcomes, and obviously if you have complications. And this, this has led to um, a lot of authors uh, advocating for multidisciplinary conferences and vetting of uh, indications and uh, mitigating risk preoperatively before you in, in embark on these uh, types of cases. And I think this is important, and what, you, what we need to factor in is if we're going to use robotics and navigation and deformity, maybe start with a sprinkling as you get used to the technology and then move on. So maybe you don't need to robotically uh, navigate every aspect of uh, top to bottom screw placement, maybe do the more difficult screws that you're worried about that have the most deformity, the most rotation, and then as you feel more comfortable, then you can do more and more um, with with the robot and with navigation. And I think that's um, pretty uh, reasonable. And, and people are doing a lot of thoughtful work on predictive modeling and looking at uh, computers to help us understand uh, the risks involved. And I think there's in the future, there'll be a way to, to to merge all these platforms together and with smart computers. Smart computers are going to be helping us during surgery. Smart computers are going to be helping us before surgery and after surgery as well. And you can see this is some of the work from Chris Ames and uh, colleagues at the ISSG and ESSG where they can kind of create profiles of hundreds of patients, thousands of patients, and match your specific patient that you're going to operate that day with uh, prior patients that have had surgery like them and who are similar in terms of their frailty, in terms of their uh, disability, in terms of uh, their limitations, and then predict exactly, very precisely, what their chance of having a complication is, what their chance of having a good improvement in their health-related quality of life outcomes, and um, and obviously what their uh, deformity correction might be. So I think uh, while the surgeon plays a big role, a lot of it has to do with who you're operating on and what they're like. And uh, these sophisticated computer systems uh, one day I think will be integrated with uh, everything. So it'll be a one-stop shop for your robot assist. It'll be not only helping you place your screw, but telling you who to operate on probably. Um, and so in conclusion, we, we're always striving towards better alignments in our patients and more accurate verification of intraoperative. And I think robotics and navigation have a role in that in the future. And obviously placing spinal implants um, efficiently is, is one, one of the first step that we've taken with robotics and navigation. But I also see value in safety and quality and uh, integrating that. Uh, I think in adult deformity surgery today, um, those screws are being placed more accurately in rotational deformities and sagittal deformities, in revisions and congenital anomalies, placing uh, iliac screws, uh, especially the S2 ailer type, which are more floor dependent, are, are much easier placing percutaneous screws at the top uh, with accuracy to avoid um, stripping the muscle and uh, subjecting patients to denervation of the adjacent facet joint and possibly 
proximal junctional failure uh, is also another uh, application. And I think a lot of studies have already proven that there's less radiation exposure, not only for the patient, even with preoperative CTs, but also for the surgeon in particular and the staff around them. So I think uh, this is a major improvement in quality of life for everyone involved. Uh, so I think that's the end of my talk. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Fisher, the moderator. Thanks, Dr. Profsaltis. Um, up next uh, will be, uh, what, if we can get the next uh, talk going. Let's see. Okay, my turn to talk. So um, I'm going to talk about um, the single position lateral surgery. Uh, this is somewhere in the middle. Uh, perfect. Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, so I'm going to be talking about uh, the advantages of robotic-assisted single-position anterior-posterior surgery. Um, so basically what I'm talking about is the difference between doing a traditional anterior procedure where a patient is supine um, and then flipping the patient and doing your posterior work um, as opposed to having the patient in the lateral position and approaching both at the same time. And um, some of the advantages that we see with this is uh, particularly in obese patients or patients with um, a lot of tissue in the abdomen, when they're supine, that's all sort of staying right over the spine. But when they're in the lateral position, it sort of falls away um, off to the side. And so uh, the approach can be a little bit easier um, and less complicated when you have uh, larger patients. And so basically, uh, you know, you can use this on any patient that you're considering doing an A-lift from L4-5 and L5-S1. Um, additionally, if you want to do a single position procedure, you can do um, lateral uh, lumbar inner body fusion, three, two, three, three, four, as, as well as with a PERC or robotic-assisted uh, pedicle screws in the back. Um, some things to consider when you're doing a, a single position uh, anterior approach is um, the pelvic incidence of the patient. So if you have a patient with a low pelvic incidence, it makes the approach to the L5-S1 level a little bit more straightforward. Um, so you have less of an angle up into the disc space. And so that can sometimes make it a little bit easier um, for some of the first cases that you're going to do. Um, you may want to take a look and just see um, if you feel comfortable um, on some of those higher PI patients. Um, uh, things to consider is, you know, which side you're going to have up for the patient, right side up or left side up. And sometimes that really depends on your working channel um, based off of preoperative imaging. Do you feel like um, a more sort of right-sided oblique approach is going to be easier based on where the vessels are at that disc space? And then also if a patient has had prior surgery in the area, um, that would make a um, retroperitoneal approach uh, a little difficult from the side if you're encountering scar tissue. So for first cases, you know, during your learning curve, you want to have the um, think about if they've had prior surgery there, maybe they're not the ideal candidate for trying out a single position anterior posterior procedure. The positioning is um, similar for lateral lumbar inner body fusion or in the anterior uh, lumbar inner body fusion. You want to think about using an AMSCO table or a Jackson flat and um, making sure that the patient is well supported um, and padded and that the, he the hips and knees are slightly flexed um, and that you have good uh, um, support so that the patient doesn't rotate slowly during the surgery. And then you're going to put some retractors based at, at the posterior soldier, sorry, posterior shoulder or the anterior knee, and this will help for um, your exposure. So basically, the approach is going to you're going to um, plan out your approach based off of the preoperative um, or intraoperative fluoros to make sure that you're parallel to the disc space, um, and your incision is going to be halfway between the midline of um, the patient and the iliac crest, and you're going to uh, sort of make an incision cranial to, um, to inguinal um, crease area. 
And so this is what the approach looks like. Um, so you're kind of right in that, uh, just above the inguinal crease and um, getting down to the disc level from a little bit of an angle. Um, so initially you think about sort of coming in at an angle, but as you get your exposure and retractors in, you end up looking sort of straight on at the disc base just from the side. Um, and so then you do all of your work in the lateral position um, as you normally would, a, dis a complete discectomy and graft placement. Um, and then you can, you know, put a plate on or some screws in your, in your cage but this is sort of what you're looking at, and this is sort of the position that you're in. Um, you can lower, you know, lower or raise the table and use a sitting stool and can be um, very comfortable. Um, and then for your posterior fixation, you can do um, either robotic-assisted or you can do um, percutaneous pedicle screws in the lateral position. So some surgeons are very facile at this. Um, and so doing it in the lateral position, you're just markings are a little bit different and you just need to make sure you drape out the back um, uh, low to the table so you can get access to the area. Um, my preference is for robotic assisted screw placement um, and in doing this I want to make sure that the fiducial markers are um, in the upgoing ilium so that um, the robot doesn't get in the way of the own uh, of your own fiducial markers. So that means you're going to put the DRB in the upgoing PSIS as well as the surveillance marker in the lateral ilium um, aimed up. And this helps to create a line of sight um, for the camera. Um, and then once you have your fiducial markers in, you can go ahead and do your merge with the intraop fluoros um, and then either pay, place K wires or um, pedicle screws uh, with your robot. And so this is your end result. You're doing, uh, you've done an ALIF and you've put your percutaneous screws. And um, so some of the pit pearls and pitfalls with this is, you know, positioning is really important. Um, so it's uh, for the first, you know, you know, the learning curve cases, you want to make sure that you're really there for all parts of the positioning and uh, making sure everything is padded and that you have good imaging um, with the floral prior to starting the surgery. Um, you know, the best cases for the first cases are going to be single-level primary um, cases where um, you're not working through scar tissue or anything like that. And then, um, you know, 4.5 and 5.1, um, both are easy to access. And if you uh, keep in mind the patient's pelvic incidence, then you can avoid having a steep angle for your L5-S1. Um, in reviewing some of our data for single position uh, surgeries, we found that we save about two to three hours per case. This is due to the simultaneous approach for the ALIS during screw placement, as well as simultaneous uh, wound closure, and then not having to do a flip. So it really saves a lot of time and anesthesia time for the patient. Um, so when you're doing the robotic assisted screws, as I mentioned earlier, you want to make sure that your fiducial markers are in a good line of sight for the camera. Um, and so that's why you want to aim them up so that you can do the, the robot can come in and um, assist the screws from both the sort of the downgoing screws and the upgoing screws uh, without blocking your own line of sight for the fiducial markers. Um, so there's a couple workflow options for anterior posterior surgery. So um, one is the non-robotic. So you can do your ALIF exposure and your ALIF, um, and then you can do the perk screws and then place your rod. Um, if you're going to do the robotic, then you want to place your DRB um, and surveillance marker. Uh, do fluoro for merge, and then merge everything. And then you can do your robotic screws during the ALIF exposure, um, but you want to uh, hold off on placing your inner body for the ALIF until your uh, robotic uh, assisted screw placement is done. Because if you do uh, you know, distract your disc space a lot or have any movement there across the level, that can affect your ability to place your uh, robotic assisted screws. Um, you know, some people would prefer to put their ALIF first and then do the merge uh, for the robot, and that's um, 
a perfectly reasonable workflow if you're using peak um, cages that don't interfere um, with the merge. But if you're doing a titanium cage, there's potential that that would interfere with the merge of the intra-op x-rays and the pre-op CT by the computer. And then you can place your rod at the end. Um, and you want to make sure you drape really low on the back side um, just so that you can have plenty of room to um, place your uh, upgoing screws, whether fluoro or robotic assisted. Um, so you want to basically plant a drape all the way down to the table. If you're using an, in so some of the systems allow for intra-op CT to then um, uh, register everything and then you are able to plan your screws off of that and um, you know for for any sort of intra-op spin you're going to want to use a Jackson flat as opposed to an ANSCO table and then there's specific um, fiducial markers that you use for the intra-op CT version and those you want to make sure are in a good position and that the patient is um, a little bit away from the edge of the table so that you're not getting that sort of overlap of the fiducial markers and the edge of the table during your spin because that can cause um, an issue because of the radio density at the edge of the table. Um, so, and you can always do a lateral lumbar inner body fusion and um, uh, percutaneous or robotic assisted screws. Uh, in the lateral position, you just want to make sure you unbreak the table prior to rod placement. Um, you know, this may seem rather uh, obvious, but, you know, in the workflow and everything, if you forget to straighten out your patient, then you're going to lock them into that alignment with your rods. So in summary, the single position uh, ALIF is a safe and appropriate uh, technique for many patients. It can really save a lot of OR time due to um, the ability to do simultaneous work. Um, and then in some patients with larger abdomens, it may actually be easier than the supine position because a lot of the abdominal contents fall away due to gravity. And then when you're doing your early cases, you know, single level primary cases are going to be the easiest, most straightforward, and consider uh, a patient's pelvic incidence to make sure you can get access and see easily your L5-S1 level. Um, so now I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Dr. Kim to talk about something near and dear to my heart, which is radiation safety um, and uh, the role of uh, minimizing radiation in uh, robotic-assisted surgery. Thank you, Dr. Fisher. Uh, my name is Young Kim, and I'm going to be talking about stereotactic navigation and image guidance, particularly with respect to the radiation and the advantage of the stereotactic navigation and image guidance on radiation exposure. So, MIS sur surgery is not something new. Uh, it dates back, it's uh, specific to our spine field. Uh, it dates back to 1960s where Kaimo Papin, those of us that are old enough will remember 60s and 70s when Kaimo Papin was routinely being injected uh, in patients with discogenic back pain. Uh, some of them had pretty good success, some of them had miserable failures. But that was kind of beginning of the uh, MIS surgery uh, for the spine. Then in the 70s, uh, percutaneous uh, discectomy uh, became popular with uh, uh, increasing use of the intraoperative fluoroscopic uh, availability. And in the 80s came the uh, laser discectomy. And in the 80s, uh, we began using uh, vertebral plasty percutaneously, we began doing uh, vertebral plasty percutaneously. And 90s was the uh, intradiscal IDET era where for a couple of years we thought we could cure the back pains of the world by performing this intradiscal electrothermal therapy. Uh, and then it came and went pretty quickly uh, due to the uh, lack of efficacy. So Emma, you, we, for the last 40, 50 years, uh, we have been trying to do uh, MIS uh, surgery in the spine 
It's just that we didn't have the right technology to do the procedures that we knew uh, were predictable and worked. So what is the advantage of uh, MIS surgery? It's obviously uh, less blood loss, smaller scar, uh, less uh, post-operative pain. And once the patient gains more experience, the procedure time gets shorter and shorter, hospital stays shorter, patient mobilizes faster, able to turn back to work faster. So it almost looks like a win-win situation for everyone. So again, patients tend to recover quicker, they have less post-operative pain, which leads to a happier patient. Uh, the uh, technique uh, is independent. To me, this is one big factor. The technique is independent of the size of the patient. The bigger they are, I feel that it's easier at times to do MI surgery on these patients, obviously, as opposed to the uh, open procedure. So it's also advantageous to the hospital because for the same DRG, patients stay a lot shorter. Uh, they have a lot decreased compli intraoperative and postoperative complications such as EBL and length of stay and in terms of uh, blood transfusion requirements and such. So it's a win situation for the hospital as well. So when, so that MIS surgery is there now, but the, what is lacking to these date has been to perform MIS surgery in a safe manner, particularly with respect to the amount of radiation. As Dr. Goldstein had alluded to earlier, MIS means maximal radiation exposure. However, with the uh, uh, rapid advancement in the uh, small portable computers in the 1990s, uh, enable us to develop machines that would allow us to do, perform MIS procedures in a safe uh, manner uh, without the uh, use of a significant amount of radiation that was needed uh, using conventional two-dimensional fluoroscopic uh, methods. So when we look at the evidence of uh, the safety and the efficacy of uh, navigation techniques such as image guidance or robotic techniques, you have to look at some of the uh, literatures so one of the earlier literatures in 2010 looked at uh, uh, performing systemic reviews of uh, uh, cases that were done on cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spine, and showed that the uh, radiation time and dose uh, was significantly lower uh, when performed with CT navigation uh, when compared to that of 2D fluoroscopic uh, navigation. Uh, a year later, a couple of years later, Another systemic review found that the, the freehand technique in open surgery had accuracy rate of 69 to 94%, whereas freehand technique utilized with fluoroscopic technique had accuracy rate up to 85%. Um, the fluoro nav guidance, which is 2D, two dimensional guidance, had up to 90% accuracy. The problem with consistently noted with freehand or fluoroscopic. Uh, method was that there was a higher incidence of medial perforation. And when this was compared to CT navigated uh, method, the accuracy was up to 100%. Uh, one of the problems encountered initially with the CT navigated uh, robotic technique was that they tend to have more of a lateral perforation due to the uh, lateral scabbing effect uh, of the robotic techniques. So again, there are many studies that came about subsequently with more data as, uh, as more data became available. Uh, what we realized is that not only did it uh, change, uh, increase the accuracy, uh, it also decreased the uh, uh, incidence of neural monitoring changes intraoperatively. And also people started looking at the amount of radiation exposure uh, that were uh, related to each techniques. So when comparing uh, CT navigation uh, to the other conventional techniques, 
the CT navigation increased pedicle screw accuracy, decreased neurologic injury, uh, and the uh, breach rate was significantly less than that of freehand or fluoroscopic assisted uh, techniques. Uh, what we learned also is that the in to imp there are many things that we have learned that improve the uh, accuracy of the navigation system, uh, such as uh, having the uh, the reference of the fiduciary markers uh, closest to the surgical region. And one of the biggest concern about the navigation system is the cost. The cost can run from anywhere from half a million dollars to over a million dollars per unit. However, there are plenty of literatures out there that actually did economical analysis. And in centers where there are more uh, than 150 cases performed per year, it actually can be fairly cost effective uh, when you consider the number of cases that may need to return to the OR for uh, misplaced uh, pedicle screws. So the traditional 3D navigation uh, system uses uh, either preoperative CT scan or intraoperative CT spin. And after that's uh, done, the registration occurs via fiducial markers on the spinous process or the uh, posterior, spine, uh, iliac, posterior superior iliac spine. Uh, and the, the one important thing is those markers cannot be touched. If it gets knocked off, then you need to re-register the whole thing again. Um, and that allows for the real-time image guidance of the uh, surgical instrumentations. Some of the newer uh, systems utilizes, uh, for example, Striker Spine Map uh, utilizes markers that are taped to the skin um, that uh, uh, minimizes the the uh, the markers getting knocked off uh, during the surgery. However, the concern is that when you're doing a big case, the soft tissue retraction can affect uh, the accuracy of this system. So this is not really a navigation system, and I apologize for the uh, the way the the X-ray is shown here. But the uh, a invasive system has a, uh, a component called a less ray. What it does is that it it takes the best uh, uh, available for a picture of the patient, and then using much less. Uh, radiation subsequently, uh, it could consistently re reproduce this image. So even if you're doing 2D floral uh, case, uh, you could minimize the amount of uh, milligray uh, or millisiever radiation that's exposed to the patient and the, uh, to the staff in the operating room uh, during the case. And it's kind of a poor man's uh, navigation uh, technique, although that machine itself is not that cheap. Um, so let's talk about the robotics. So initially, we did the MIS techniques using the uh, 2D fluoroscopic machine. Then came uh, the uh, navigation system. Now we have a couple of robots that are FDA approved for spine use, and our hospital has a fairly extensive uh, experience with the Globus robot, Excelsius. Um, and what we have known with use of the robotic technology is that it actually increases uh, the accuracy and the timing of the screw placement, uh, even when we compare that to the purely uh, uh, 3D navigation system. And in terms of the radiation exposure for the staff in the OR, it's literally a zero because one can certainly walk out of the room to register and walk back into the operating room and perform the surgery without the CM even being in the operative field. So why is this so important? Because when you look at the, some of the studies um, that look at the amount of radiation exposure to the patient, as well as to the surgeons. It's one thing for the patient because they get these surgeries once, twice in their lifetime. But surgeons were in there day in, day out. We're constantly getting radiated. And although uh, the amount of radiation per case may not be that significant, the, 
the one thing about the radiation is the cumulative effect that could cause long-term uh, side effects such as uh, sarcoma and other cancers, as Dr. Goldstein had earlier alluded to. So if you look at these cases, look at how much uh, fluoroscopic time is being utilized when someone is doing uh, interbody fusion as opposed to some of the other smaller techniques. So we are constantly bombarded with radiation when we're performing these procedures. And when you have all this data that support uh, use of navigation, use of robotics to really significantly cut down uh, on the amount of radiation that's exposed to the surgeon and the OR staff, uh, as well as to the patient intraoperatively, it almost becomes a uh, no-brainer that we should be adopting this technique uh, as a, a standard uh, rather than just to make the case go uh, just faster or uh, just for uh, other purposes. So, as I said, uh, machines such as OARM or Aero uh, te uh, technology in triopolis spinning allows for uh, acquisition of patient's anatomy in the OR without the surgeon and the OR staff actually being in the room. And that, in turn, will allow us to perform these procedures safely. And as you look at the data, the the the, the rate of accurate uh, uh, screw placement is significantly uh, higher in these type of uh, techniques than the freehand or freehand floor techniques. So the key point is that the navigation technique improves uh, the accuracy when compared uh, with uh, freehand techniques with use of the fluoro, but most importantly, it is the radiation safety for the surgical team, the surgeon, as well as a, a patient uh, with the use of the uh, uh, navigation uh, system and the uh, robots. Thank you. All right, thanks, Dr. Kim. Um, and that uh, concludes our four talks for this evening. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to uh, type them in and we can take a look and see. Um, otherwise, let's see. And just as a reminder to our audience, if you would like to ask a question, you can type your questions into that Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. Looks like we have no questions at this yeah. time. So, any any concluding comments from our speakers before we uh, conclude the presentation? Well, I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us this evening, um, and I I hope you had a uh, an educational session. And if there are no questions, we can definitely conclude. And um, you know, please reach out if there are any other questions. Um, you can email me at charlotte at fisher at nyulangone.org um, if you have any further questions offline. Fantastic. Well, thank you all so much. And on behalf of NYU School of Medicine, I would like to thank you all for your participation in today's event. Please feel free to download the course presentations in your handout section. You will now be redirected to the CME login page. Please log in and take a moment to complete the appropriate course evaluation and attest to your credits to obtain your certificate. This concludes today's program. Thank you all, and have a great day.